thanks to Jill for the music as well. And um, just of course, I want to say my appreciation to Ronnie for asking me in the first place. And um, so, uh, folks, if you want to maybe turn in your Bible to Nehemiah uh, chapter 4, that's what I'm going to be on today. So, Nehemiah chapter 4, and uh, maybe just pray before we start. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, again for the availability of your word. We thank you, Lord God, for the ability to come and hear the word of God preached. And I just pray, Lord, you would, as our brother says, move in this meeting mightily. Just pray that you utterly take me out of the way. And Lord God, you take any imagination or, or idea of man and put it out of the way in order that we would hear your word speaking. And that's this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, about a year ago, or slightly over a year ago, um, Ronnie asked me to speak at the midweek, one week. Uh, the first time that I spoke, what I decided to talk about was the theme of fear in the life of a Christian and how we can respond to fear correctly or incorrectly. Uh, and then I think it would have been last year I spoke at another midweek, I think over the summer, I talked about the, the experience of Moses in the book of Exodus. Following on from after he had, had his dealings with Pharaoh, and uh, when he first uh, embarked out, uh, whenever him and Sephora came over in the time, and uh, how he was pressing on against fear and opposition at that time. And when I was thinking about what I might talk about today, and uh, to me, why it sort of come to a thing. What I, what I thought about was the idea of building and persevering in God's work in the midst of opposition, that whenever you step out, that uh, there's an ongoing, it's really an ongoing struggle in the Christian life, and it's an ongoing uh, perseverance. And it, I didn't initially think of this, but what was led to me in chapter 4, about a man who God had called to lead the work of the rebuilding of the wall of the town of Jerusalem. At a time when the people were at a low way, they were disillusioned, uh, even after having come back from the uh, exile, and he came into a, a position where God had tasked him with leading through a lot of opposition. So, uh, I'll just start, I'll just read the whole chapter, um, uh, chapter 4. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wrought and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these people Jews? What, what do these people Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now, to the end, the Ammonite was dying when he said, Even that which they build at the fox walk, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger. Before the builders. <clears throat> so built to be the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah, and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth, and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God, but set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Jesus said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see ye, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. 
And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt about in Judea, they said unto us ten times, For all the places which you shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked the rose up, and said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your, your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was no one to us, and God had brought their counsel to know that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass in the time for that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows. And the Abergians and the rulers were behind all of the, all of the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work. Of the other hand held a weapon, for the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so built it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles and the rulers and the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated from the wall, one far from another. In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we laboured in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning, till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, Let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us, and labour in the day. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one of them put off for washing. <clears throat> so, I think what I've sort of uh, wrote here to, to summarize Nehemiah chapter 4 is basically a snapshot of God's people as they're involved in the work of God mm -hmm. and the challenges that they face both from a, a spiritual point of view and from a physical or practical point of view as well. There's a little bit about the background of the book. Uh, what, Scholars seem to believe that both the book of Ezra and the Amal were written by the same author, that's Ezra, originally according to his own book, except during the reign, the reign of Artaxerxes, the Persian king, who had allowed the Judeans to return, or at least a remnant, uh, to their homeland following the earlier captivity. Now, Nehemiah has been described as the cupbearer to the king. And the, held a position of representing his people within the courts of Artaxerxes. And he came to be tasked with uh, leading the people during this war, rebuilding the wall that they, we read earlier in the book of the Amaya that the uh, buildings of Jerusalem, the wall itself had collapsed and come into a, a state of irre repair and have been neglected for so long. And as I said, the people were disorganized, they were spiritually not in a good place, they were demoralized. And so Nehemiah steps into this position, how to act as, a, as a, a, a more, an encourager, above maybe more than an, obviously a leader, but above all he would have to galvanize the people. Um, we need to turn right away to it, but if we go to the very start of uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, Nehemiah's prayer for the Israel at this time, chapter 1 and verse 4, gives us an idea of the sort of heart that this, this man had. And when he heard, he had heard of the great affliction that approach the wall in verse 3, the wall of Jerusalem, also to put the in the sort of a burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept on more certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Really, that is the sort of approach that we need to be uh, starting off with and any sort of undertaking for God. I know we uh, refer to our brother in praying already. We need to have a heart that is consecrated in the place of prayer, really before we go into a meeting or before we um, 
embark on any sort of activity for God. And here we see that in Nehemiah's concern for Jerusalem, he was to lead the people back to the solemn practices of love, the reading the law, fasting and praying and renewing their covenants. It was commitment to recovering the spiritual identity that they came away from. It was symbolized by building the wall, by reconstruct, in a sense, spiritually, they were building a reconstruction, sorry, reconstructing their spiritual faith and their, their walk with God. Paralleled the physical rebuilding of the wall that had served as a, as a, as a, a, a an honor to the name of God. So, as we see, as this work started to take place, as we fast forward now to chapter 4, it came to pass that what the, uh, the foreign nations that were round about came to be aggravated and jealous. And here we see probably some of the, one of the first category I noted of the sort of opposition that comes against the work of the church in, in our time. And that is, that of the idle words and the uh, words that provoke the worry and the words that lead us to discouragement that come out of the world. Now, Sam Ballad and Tobiah, they were local government, governors from uh, the nations outside of the Jews. Sam Ballad was known as Sam Ballad and Horde because of uh, where he was from, but he was a Samaritan uh, abstraction. Uh, Tobiah, who was sort of his, uh, his compatriot or his second command, he was an Ammonite. And they would likewise, they would have been under Xerxes, but they would have been opposed very much to the Judeans and what they were doing because of that natural uh, history and that resentment against the people of God. Uh, if we even turn just quickly to Nehemiah chapter 2, and verse 10, it describes from some Balak the Horonite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite. Heard of it, that is the plans to go ahead with the rebuilding. Uh, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So this is the this is a snapshot as well of what it does in the heart of the enemies of God when he sees work and, and building going on for God. Satan hates as we all know, Satan hates the church. Satan hates to see people coming to Christ. He also hates to see churches being planted. He hates to see missions going ahead. He hates to see evangelism going ahead. He hates to see, even from a practical point of view, I'm sure he hates to see buildings being put up. He hates to see anything that advances the kingdom of God in any way. And here we see that in the paper. Now notice from verses 1 to 6 we see really the prince of the air at work. And we know about it very much about the Prince of the Air in our day, but here we see Satan using these men to speak forth things that were really vicious and, and cunning to the people as they went about their work. And if we just we break into chapter one again, it came to pass upon St. Ballad, heard that we built the wall, he was wrong with great indignation, and mocked, he mocked the Jews, and spake before his brethren on the army of Samaria and said, what do, as in what do, what are these people doing? What are they, what are they at? What do these people choose? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? You know, in the sort of attitude that's involved in this fourth year, we can see a lot of that in the world today in terms of those that hate God and hate his people. Um, I don't know what situation I represent, but I'm sure in the workplace or in other places we'll come across those that have a, a mocking attitude towards the things of God. And, you know, maybe it just takes an example, I'll not refer to closely, but I can think of people in a workplace who mock the idea of um, people that they work to give assistance with. Uh, receiving help from Christian agencies or, or uh, 
be it helped to be made more amenable to the Word of God. They don't see the point of it. They, they deride anything that is built on the Word of God. And that is the same attitude here with some bad. In his mind, in his, his, his uh, darkened state, he, he didn't see. I mean, he, of course, in the long run, the work was to be completed. In fact, uh, it's recorded historically that this work was completed very rapidly within the course of 52 days because of, well, not because of Nehemiah himself, but because of the, the Lord working through him, and also the way the Lord worked through the people. And some thought in his heart was darkened to this. He couldn't understand it. He didn't foresee. And he probably there was some degree of fear, some degree of trepidation in here as well, because the enemy is threatened by the work of God. I never forget that the enemy is afraid of the progression of God's kingdom moving forth. As we read on, uh, now Tobiah the Ammonite was with him. And Tobiah chips in with this very nasty and petty comment where he said, Even that which they build, that a fox walk he shall even break down their stone wall. So he said, How do I be living with that? And we can see the same today, really, as well, in terms of the way a lot of those who are opposed to the work of God try to belittle the church. It's at such a pitch today, it's nearly universal as well. The, the belittlement of the, uh, the nasty comments around the church. Now, look at the response that Nehemiah and the leading people brought to this. In verse 4. Hear the word of God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for prey in the land of their captivity. So Nehemiah, in this instance, he would have been aware, and those who would have been around him would have been aware too, of the sort of uh, talk that was coming out of these men, and the effect that potentially it could have on the people, uh, in terms of discouraging them, in terms of dragging them away from the task at hand. Immediately, what does he do? He doesn't even, he doesn't go to talk to these men. He doesn't try to rebut them. He doesn't make any arguments. such. He goes immediately to the place of prayer. One thing I would say is perhaps there's a lesson in that for us. Proverbs 26, verses 4 through 5, tells us, Answer not a fool according to his folly lest they also be like unto him. And sometimes, it's, e it's even easy sometimes in days like this that we live in, and the opposition that we face, it's a natural thing. When we hear the church of God and the things of God being mocked and attacked, if we are in Christ, and if we do belong to him alone, it's a natural thing for us to be grieved by that. And then, you know, frustration and anger can rise up in us. And we know there's such a thing as righteous anger. But sometimes you see it, you know, I'm not saying I, I probably I have failed in this respect over the years in certain ways too. We see certain Christians, and we see, especially if they're on the world of social media, they can get into a slimy match. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And over and over. And what does it really achieve at the end of the day? Now, Hezekiah had no uh, thought of getting into such a thing with these men. He saw the threat and immediately he went to God for his help there again, uh, uh, building them and uh, starting himself off in the face of prayer. You know, debates and apologetics are very important things and they have their place. But we need to be coming at this again from a right uh, standing point. We don't need to get into a, a signing match or a battle, a verbal battle with the world on every uh, jot and tittle of any, every debate. Because sometimes that can just be a sheer waste of time. It can do, be something that will only build up the devil's kingdom and something that can only uh, detract from the word of God. Uh, when I was thinking of this particular verse, uh, just one other instance here in Scripture came to my mind. 
that I've, I've talked about before. When I was at it, and you need to turn to it, but Second Kings 19, 14 to 15, Hezekiah, whenever the Judeans were surrounded by this number of the armies, Hezekiah had no uh, way to go, he had no practical or no negotiating answer to the enemy coming in. And what he did was go simply go straight to the place of prayer in 2 Kings 19. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord in recognition. Number one, and what I see in these, both of these instances is a recognition of human, our own human frailty. A recognition that a God is not going to be in this work. And this work of building that Nehemiah was associated with nothing was going to come up with it. was not going to succeed. And so they went right to that source, right to that uh, encouragement. So this is, I believe, something of a, a guide to how we should respond to the discouragements and the, uh, the whispers and the verbal uh, mockings and so on of the world. I know from my own experience, even after becoming a Christian, whenever you take a moment and you look from a from a spiritual point of view at a lot of the stuff that is around you. What I, what I mean by that is the TV, the internet, etc. It's sometimes when you actually take a step back, it would really shock you the degree to which the uh, Prince of the Air has such a control. I mean, I mean this is the case. In these days, this was probably the 5th century BC, in terms of how he used men and he used rulers to attack his people. Think about the pervasiveness of mass media in our day and how easy it is, and I hold my hand up how easy it is to let your guard down in front of television and, and so forth. It, um, my brother said that, you know. Man can hardly keep his tongue for an hour before he lets his character down. I wonder how long it is he can hold his attention for before something in comes in. And again, I'm not trying to be judgmental, I'm not trying to point fingers at any other Christian, but I think, and it's, we know from uh, being under this pulpit, we're not under any illusions. There is a malaise in Western Christianity. That in this day and age, there is a, a real lack of spiritual discipline. There is a, a lukewarmness that is round about in apathy. And there's different reasons for it, but it seems to me there, it, one clear reason is that we have failed to discern and we have failed to cut out a lot of the voices that are coming in. And one of the, surely one of the main avenues of that is mass media and the culture of today being bombarded. We're, we're like, we're almost in a sort of a trench being bombarded over and over again wherever we turn. And I, I want, I'll say as well, a lot of Christians are surprisingly naive in terms of how far they can go to even accommodate things on television and, and other things. We need to be more wise about how we give our time, and are we given enough time of, of our time to the things of God? Because I believe, I honestly believe within the last, well probably a couple of generations at least, so many of the people of God have become so desensitized. Because they've lived at an age that is, we're so bombarded with so much of the world, and it, it, is, the, it is the kingdom of Satan. Uh, and so much of the stuff that's put out, it is, it's not just by accident, it is designed to demoralize the people and demoralize the corrupt society. And the Christians are desensitized. And we need a real awakening for that. We need to prioritize our time and we need an awakening to the where we put our trust as well. We put our trust in God rather than man. And we, we all know that, but above all, we need to be looking in the fashion of Hezekiah. We need to be we need to be wise as to how we set shut out the discouragements and the comments of the world in our day. <coughs> Something I sort of touched on as well here, 
it's, I don't want to get on too much of a, 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 a tangent on this subject. <clears throat> but let's look at verses 4 to 5. Here are God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover up their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Nehemiah here is begging God to take notice of the indignities that were done unto them. And in this, and this is just, I'm reading a commentary here from uh, the Matthew Henry. And in this way we are to imitate them. He begs of God to avenge their cause and turn the reproach upon the enemies themselves. And when I read about that, what my mind was turned to the subject of imprecatory praying. Now, I'll not take too long on this because I haven't looked into it all that deeply to go into a tangent, so I'm not going to do that. But imprecatory prayers are throughout scripture, particularly the imprecatory psalms. And in many quarters, this is something that is somewhat overlooked or somewhat passed by in church circles today. David is uh, most associated, perhaps, with the imprecatory psalms. In Psalm 7, 35, 55, 58, 59, 69, 109, 139, David is recorded as asking God in some form or other to bring judgment upon his enemies. We can see even in the word of Christ, we need to turn to it right now, but in Matthew 5 and Luke 6, uh, God told us to pray for his enemies. But at the same time, in John 15, Jesus quotes from Psalm 35, verse 9, and Psalm 69, verse 4. So we know that well, it's, it's obvious that these uh, imprecatory psalms are not merely, you know, the musings of David in his seeking for revenge, in his uh, grievance. These are part and parcel of scripture. Now, it raises the question, why are we to take on this, uh, this part of this role of the word of God? Because imprecatory psalms are there. We... I think we need to be very careful. <coughs> we don't, I don't believe that we should necessarily by any means be going out and praying judgment on individual people. We shouldn't be going out and, uh, you know, using it. Not that we would start off to, but there's probably the uh, potential that we could come to use it as a, as a weapon. Maybe to, as I say, what David might have thought of avenging his own grief. Or we might use it as a weapon to get back at others that may have hurt us. I think that's a dangerous road. We struggle against spiritual enemies, spiritual principalities and powers in high places, Ephesians 6 and 12. But nonetheless, I believe we are to use in certain occasions that power of imprecation because we do struggle against these powers of darkness. And we see in our day and age the sort of strongholds that are raised up in our land. And it's right that we, I believe, should pray that if it's God's will, He will tear them down. For example, I mean, in this fellowship, it's been prayed different times over that, you know, if, if, if there is an immoral government, a corrupt government in the land, that if it's within God's will, that He will replace it with just government. And that's, of course, down to this discretion of the Almighty, but it, it is right that we should pray, but we should be very comfortable, we, sorry, we should be very discerning and careful. When I was listening to a message, I, my initial uh, plan wasn't to go into this subject, but I was listening to a message based around the MI4, and the minister spoke about these verses, and again he agreed that it is a complex subject. And one we need to be very careful about. He said in his belief, and I'll just leave this thought with you, he said that there are certain times, certain times, with certain people, in his view, we should pray. And I know that these are strong words, 
that his, his words were that we should pray for them either to be saved, born again, that God would either save them or bury them. So, I'll leave that thought with you. Now, in the midst of this, what do we see as well? We'll move on to verse 6. So built we the wall, and all the walls joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. <coughs> the people had a mind to work. And that's not surprising because they were under a good leadership. Now that, that again, that's not to make a big deal of the men that were leadership. It, it, obviously they were provided, they were men that were raised up by God. And ultimately, the, the, the spirit that people had, it was fostered and it was given by the Lord. Now, in one sense, when they had a mind to work, they, yes, they obviously did have a good work ethic, because as we know, this work was done fairly speedily and efficiently. But nonetheless, there's a wider application to see that the vigor that others had, notwithstanding what was going on around them, their hearts were on it. And, you know, if the, if the opposition hadn't been there, maybe they would have done it even faster, who knows. But this is another way, I believe, in which the church today, another picture of how we need to respond to the opposition of the world around us. When we need to have that heart to be at work. Sometimes, I referred there a minute ago to how we can get into endless debates, of, and not that debates obviously have their place, we can get in, get way late into the endless debates of the world that we think sometimes our first and foremost priority needs to be on working for God. And we need to have our priorities right in that sense. It's possible to, sometimes Christians have their fingers in different pies, they're trying to get to be involved in different ministries here and there, and their time's divided, and they end up being more ragged. We need that, uh, clear uh, guidance going forward and I believe here that people had that they knew the task at hand and they had a plan and they were executing it for God's glory moving on to the chapter 7 but came to pass that when some Sanballat and the Atlas and the Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashtarites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped and they were very wroth and conspiring against all of them to come and fight against Jerusalem and hinder it. This is very interesting that the opponents of God and the forces which can bring discouragement and bring opposition, they may often be multifaceted. One thing I thought of this today is it's very interesting when you see a lot of the, uh, and it's just an example that comes to mind, we see a lot of the uh, Islamic influence in the country and a lot of false religions. A lot of these uh, TV and media forces that would be very much into liberalism and would deride the things of God and they would deride any idea of morality in our day and would uh, mock us for standing up with the things of God. Yet, when the time is convenient, they can join together on a common cause with the, the Muslims or any other group that are divided, that are that are not on the page of the people of God. And we see the same thing here. Tobiah and the, the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashtonites, these are all disparate uh, groups that probably were in different cultures, they had different religions, maybe worship different gods. I don't know quite enough about them. But isn't it interesting that when the people of God were on the move, when they were active observing them, <laughs> they can put their differences aside very easily and they can come together. There's another example of this in scripture. If we do have to turn to it right now, we go to Luke uh, chapter 23. And I'll just bear with me. Sorry. Luke chapter 23 and verse 12. Sorry. 
talking about, he said, Pilate and Herod, and how they would be at death dealing with Christ. And verse 12, And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were an en en enemy between themselves. You know, uh, you think of the, the, the animosity that would have been between Herod and the uh, leading as he was, the sort of uh, the Jews who were rebellious and, and resented the Roman occupation of, of those days. And the, against the Roman governor Pilate, and yet, with all, when Christ comes into the picture, the, the, his enemies are the common cause. Uh, it speaks again to the true nature of Christ. It speaks again to what his message and, and, and what he brought. But uh, we see that here. The, there was a conspiracy forming. And here we see the beginning of another threat to the work of the people of God, and we see it already, that there is an actual, uh, sometimes an actual physical threat, or a real practical threat, more and more. I have a, a friend who I had recently applied for part-time work with uh, some government agency, and we had a while for a response to come back, and when it did come back, he was totally had been turned down. Uh, it was a, a civil service type sort of job. And on the uh, response, it actually told him, you were given out uh, gospel literature at uh, Pride March, somewhere in Northern Ireland, uh, in the summer last year. And uh, that's homophobic, so you're forgot about it as far as this job goes. And that, sadly, that is an example of the sort of opposition. I mean, it, that, 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 is, that's a, that in itself is quite a serious attack. If you can deny somebody the ability to work, deny them their livelihood, it's no joke. And we need to be aware of that before we're in the sort of days when that will become more and more evidently an actual practical opposition. An actual, uh, it might be in the workplace, it might be being denied work, it might be going forward that more and more that will seek to actually ban people preaching the gospel in open air, coming out openly preaching the moves are from the bringing the laws, I believe, to do away with that. So that's a separate subject from here today, but we need to be prepared, we need to be ready for that. However, you see, the people who responded to it moved eventually with courage because they were not shaken. Isaiah 26 and 3 tells us that uh, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. They were not, they were not moved by the prince or the power of the air, and they were not moved by, here we see there were, there were real uh, liberal threats that were coming to fruition. But the people stayed strong. As you read on, chapter, uh, verse 9, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God, and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Verse 10, And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. Um, and our adversaries said, They shall not go, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. Now, here we see in verse 10 is the idea of weariness in the work of God. And that can be another uh, burden. And though another way that the enemy will use to get at people who are engaged in building for God. It says here that their strength was decayed. Matthew Henry in his commentary says that isn't it so interesting that at the very moment when the people had become weary, and they become tired because they, they were obviously working physically hard and they were exercised mentally. It's at that very moment when the enemies of God were ready to strike. They were ready to pick them off. Uh, very often, it's when we are at a vulnerable point, when we're weary or tired, that's when we lose focus. We need to understand rest is key within the uh, disciplines of God as well. Rest is a biblical principle. 
And Psalm 127, verse 2 says, It is vain for me to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sheep. Now, if I'm being totally honest, I probably need to learn that, but put that out of principle more myself. <laughs> but I'll put sitting up late at night and stuff. But we, we look to him to strengthen people. In this instance, we're beginning perhaps to pray because you, the mental and the physical in this life are joined together. One will have an impact on the other in terms of how we abuse the physical or the our spiritual life suffers. You know, the, the spirit, the, we, we wound ourselves spiritually. And if we are, quite often, if we are in a bad shape spiritually, this physical will also suffer as well. It's just a, a natural course of things. We're reminded, again, in Philippians 4 and 13, that Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And it's a simple verse. We get it's, it's such an encouraging verse, it's been a real encouragement we can use in the past. We need, Paul talked about running the race, Paul was eager to finish the race for God, as were these people of God that were engaged in this work. But at the same time, he knew that it was God's strength that he relied upon. And here we see what can happen when we sometimes take our eyes off that. As soon as we took our eyes off that, the enemy were hanging up the people here. Also, in here, the junk that was left when they were they were rebuilding the walls, there was, I suppose, when they collapsed, there was a lot of rubble and uh, rubbish and stuff that was lying around and had to be cleared away. And in some respects, that can speak of after we are converted, there can be a lot of junk left, even in our lives even as, as, as Christians. And that can be a number of things. It can be unprofitable associations with different people. It can be sometimes a besetting sin that we must deal with and have put out of our lives and overcome. It can be as a wrong company. It can be negative thoughts. It can be a low self-esteem. And these are things again that can form strongholds, that can weigh us down in our walk of God, and weigh us down in our ability to work for God. If, if we are, if we, if we have a low self-esteem, and the devil is constantly picking it back and trying to bring us down through that, we won't imagine in our minds, we, we won't believe and trust God that we can approach the work that He's given us in the way that we should. And there are various items. We are, again, we are called in 2 Corinthians 10 5, casting out all imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we look to God to remove these things and take them out of our way. Reading verse 12, and it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Now these seem to be, from reading the account, they seem to be some of the, the people who had lived, not near the uh, sort of uh, the main settlement in Jerusalem, but they lived out by them, by the, the foreign nations, by the enemies. And uh, they had come to warn Hezekiah as to that they had obviously heard through the grapevine of what the enemies were planning to do. Now, Matthew Henry says here that it's interesting to note that they had the zeal to come and tell him. And indeed, they said unto us ten times they were so uh, worked up, they were so concerned about what might come to pass, and they wanted to protect the people and protect the world. But at the same by the same token, they did not have the zeal to actually be involved in the building work. And we wonder what can we what can we infer from that? Well, there, there are two sides to it. In one sense, I'm sure it is a blessing from God the fact that these people did bring the news of the injury to Hezekiah. And I'm sure he was grateful that God had arranged for it. 
But at the same time, isn't it interesting that they felt something convicted to come and tell them and were so earnest? Is it possible that they felt guilt from being separated from the main body of the people that they knew that that's where they should be and they should be putting their backs into the work in whatever way they could? Was that, was that part of what motivated them to come so quickly? And it serves as a reminder, perhaps, to us that we need to be in. Obviously, we need to be in the fellowship. We need to be around the work of Christ. We need to be around other believers. We need to be around believers in, in, that will build us up, and we can build them up as well. If we separate us from the, the the public assembly of God, or even if we are attending. The assembly what we perhaps you know some people can go through the motions they can go to church on a Sunday and they can they can pay lip service but they're not walking with God they're not building that relationship with the people of God through the week so I suppose in a sense it's, it's, it's partly conjecture but I just wonder was it a, an element of guilt among these Jews that lived out inside that brought them there again we see Hezekiah bringing to uh, the place of prayer in response to this and the, the verses that they had here we see that response in, in prayer and petition to God but we also see when there is an actual practical difficulty we see practical uh, planning from Hezekiah in terms of how he responded to this threat Hezekiah was a man who was made what it was necessary to be, but equally he was a man of great strength. We see, we see at the very start of the book how he was very much laboured in, in prayer, he was very convicted and very uh, wrought at the state, and he pleaded with God that God might use them to correct this. There's another side to him, and you need to turn to it, but I'm just going to go ahead and look toward the end um, in Hezekiah chapter 13. Uh, not to go into it here today, but just to summarize, eventually it came to pass that uh, some of the, uh, the Jews did intermarry and intermix with the nations around them. Which was obviously uh, an abominable thing to God because this was a corruption of the holy light that would eventually lead to Christ. And this was something that God had clearly prescribed and, and uh, outlawed in his law. But nonetheless, it, it's so often, you know, whenever the people can go through a high, it's the same today, you know, we can come to a spiritual plateau and after a certain period, like, I believe a lot of Christians today have become so acclimatized, they've become so comfortable, so at ease in Zion, that over time the devil would work his way in gradually and subtly. And so this intermingling had happened that was, that was totally wrong. And just go, if we look at Hezekiah, or sorry, Nehemiah 13, go to verses 23, Nehemiah's response In those days also I saw, saw I Jews. That had married the wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Boab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and I cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, He shall not give your, your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king, king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. This is the sort of, uh, the, the sort of bigger, the sort of uh, zeal that Nehemiah had. He was a good governor and he inquired into the well being of his people, but he had no time. He, see, he saw the evil of sin and the obligation that he had to war against it. So, in what I'm saying is that he was a man who thought of all these factors 
and consider them. And so in verse 13, Therefore set I the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people out with their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the noble and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren and 